the old school mixtape number one. You and I met 28 years ago in Lake Butler, Florida. We'll talk about that here in a couple mm-hmm. of minutes. Before we get to that conversation, I want you to know that I wore this jersey just for you. Smart that- man. Smart man. <laughs> yeah. Because, Reggie, you are a faithful Miami Hurricane fan. And uh, I want you to sum up in five words the classic rivalry between Miami and FSU. F S who, who, who. Wow. By the way, who's got the all time. Do you know who's got the all time win head to head between those two? Uh, actually I don't, but I know they beat us the last couple of years Uh, after we had beaten them a couple of years. So uh all I can think back to the nineties, it was like wide right every year. Right. Yep. You're also, you're not only a Miami uh, Hurricane fan, but you are a Raider Nation faithful. Yes. Tell us your favorite Raiders moment of all time. Kenny Stabler. And you have to, you know, date yourself to know who Kenny Stabler is, but he threw a pass to a guy named Dave Casper. It was a tight end, number 87. And it was the last play of the game, and he was about to get tackled. So he fumbled the ball on purpose, and he pushed it in the end zone, and he jumped on top of it, and they scored a touchdown, and they won. And that changed the rule forever. You can't do that no more. Kenny Stabler. Now, he was he the snake? Yes, sir. That was his nickname, the snake. Well, did the he snake. get it from that play? <laughs> no, he, uh, he probably got that with some of his behavior growing up. <laughs> so what what year was that when, when he shoved it into the end zone like I that? cannot tell you. You don't remember? Years, but you were a li- little guy, play. huh? I can remember the play. Well, I still remember the Raiders Patriots championship game, the famous Tom Brady oh, Tuck game, God. right? Oh, 2002. Man. I'm going to set the stage here so you and I yeah. We're on a ministry trip. We were on a tour visiting several different uh, youth detention centers and youth prisons in New York City. Yes, sir. And we came back to the hotel one night to watch that game. And this is like before Tom Brady ever even made it to the Super Bowl, right? Right. And we watched that game in the hotel room. And uh, it was a heartbreaker, wasn't it? Yeah, Charles Woodson. Charles Woodson hit Brady, didn't he? Yes, Fumble all day. So here we are, and the rule has been changed, right? I guess at least once, yeah, maybe a, the, a couple of times tuck, over the years. The tuck rule. <laughs> the tuck rule. Yeah. So, so I'm curious, because I remember what a heartbreak that was for you back then, but, you know, seeing oh, the evolution of the tuck rule and all of that. So after all these years, what do you have to say about the tuck rule? It came to, it was too late. Have you held on to, like, animosity towards Tom Brady all these years? No, I kind of like Tom Brady. He's you like Tom? He's the GOAT. I mean, I give props where props is due. It was officials. It wasn't Tom, you know. Yeah. It was officials. And he took – that that play catapulted him. I mean, from that that play on, he he took off. They won the Super Bowl, right? Right. Who knows if that's a different outcome – how he would have turned out, but that play catapulted him. I have more animosity towards Ohio State against the Miami Hurricanes in in 2002 and game over and a phantom pass interference flag flew out and we lost that national championship. It would have been two in a row. So, Uh, yeah. Yeah, I need, I got, I got to still, you know, seek God on that one. (laughs) Now you played collegiate basketball in the 80s, right? Is that correct? Yes. In Sam Houston State University. And yes. during that time, I believe you played against Dennis Rodman? Yes, sir. We beat him. So did Rodman have the nickname, The Worm, back then? Or is that something that came later? He was The Worm. 
He was the worm in college too. He he was the worm. He was he was tough. I mean, we didn't know who he was. You know, like I said, we beat him in the game, but he had like thirty one points and twenty rebounds. And you know, Dennis Rodman is not a scorer, but all he did was just get every offensive rebound and just put it back in. Yeah. So I never knew he was going to become the Rodman that you know the Hall of Famer, but. He was he was uncanny. He was unorthodox. A funny guy to play against, but yeah, he he was tough. So I have to share this with you. Last year, I was in South Korea. We were doing sports ministry, doing uh, an English camp, and doing doing American sports. And one of the missionaries actually asked me. He said, "Are you interested in bringing this sports ministry into the north?" And uh, I'm thinking we're a little <laughs> south of Seoul. <laughs> so I thought he was thinking maybe, you know, back up to Seoul. And then it hit me. No, he's talking about like North Korea, like the real North Korea. So I thought it was a joke, but he was dead serious. And uh, it just shows you the heart of missionaries who are truly praying and yeah. just believing that one day those doors are going to be open to take the gospel to people in, in North Korea. And I remember what he told me, and it just blew me away. He said that, you know, when Dennis Rodman went to North Korea, yeah. A few years back after he left there, this missionary told me they've been building basketball courts all across North Korea ever since. <laughs> he went and took a couple of his buddies with him to play a couple games over there. Like I like five or six ex NBA players went over there with them one time and they got a lot of, you know, ridicule for that when they got back. I didn't know that he had a whole team, so he took some other guys over there too, huh? He took like enough for two teams to actually play against each other to entertain Kim Jong Un. And now they're building basketball courts all over North Korea. Hey man, you know with God, Jimmy, they building basketball courts now, and you know the next thing you know they'll be building more churches because mm. because God is that powerful. I was kind of surprised hearing a missionary use Dennis Rodman, right, as like the poster child of inspiration for right. the gospel one day being able to go forth across North Korea and the, the power of sport. God said he'll take the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. I think it was Billy Graham that was talking about Billy Sunday, who was a professional baseball player back in the day. And he said, when, when God needs a man to change the world, he doesn't always go to the seminary, but sometimes he'll go to the ball field and he'll wow. grab somebody, you know? Wow. I always compare um, Tom Brady to, 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 to King David when he wasn't the king. You know, David was like the eighth round draft choice. If it had been a draft when all the other sons was, was actually ch chosen in front of him or preferred in front of him, he was the last one picked, and it was pretty much like Tom Brady. He was a he was a like a seventh round draft choice, or or uh, Brock Purdy was the last player picked in the whole draft. Mister Irrelevant. Mister Irrelevant, and and and, and David would have been Mister Irrelevant if you had used those terms back then. But look how relevant he became. Mister Irrelevance can make a difference in the world that we're living in, can't they? Wow. Yeah, I love how you said, you know, God chose the foolish things of the world, right? And yeah. and he does that. That's his promise. He delights in using things that may maybe they're weak or unorthodox or just somebody else looks at it and says, no way. But that passage says that God will do that so that no man will boast. Exactly. But that Jesus will get all the glory and how it <laughs> unfolds. It's crazy when he says confound the wise, you know, you I mean confuse the wise. And, and I can imagine you got a lot of these people that's educated and the scholars and whatnot wondering, I, I don't understand how this person can do this. And it's, it's confusing them because he's not qualified or this or that or the other, but yet he's prospering. And so it, it, it confounds the wise because they can't figure out how this person is capable of doing these things. and But but it says God would take the foolish things of the world. So there's your answer, but they don't, they don't get it. Hmm. Yeah. God delights to take uh, the, the against all odds candidate yes, sir. and set them up for something big. So let's talk about your college days, really your childhood. You, you played basketball, at Sam Houston state, but take us back to your childhood growing up in Ocala, Florida, some of your childhood experiences, really just 
paving the way, leading us all the way up to your days at Sam Houston State? You know, I was one of those kids that, of course, we didn't have Xbox and PS4 or 5s or whatever. And so we found things to do outside. And I just loved sports. I can, As a kid, I can remember the Dolphins going undefeated and almost name every player on that team. And, and and so I love sports and just baseball and basketball, football, because I could play them all. I was a, I was a good athlete. I could play every sport, but actually, football was a sport that I loved more than anything in this world. I mean, basketball was not even, you know, second. Football mm. was number one and one A. I wanted to go to the University of Southern California and play wide receiver because Lynn Swan at that time was my idol. I wanted to be the next Lance Swan. So that was my, my dreams. I always wanted to play football. So I played youth football and I was good. And I played football in ninth and tenth grade in high school. And and then as far as basketball in ninth grade, I went out because my friends did. And I didn't start. Uh, I just I was playing because my friends was playing, but something happened between ninth and tenth grade. I grew five inches. I was 5'5 five five when I entered ninth grade. I was 5'10 when I entered 10th grade. I don't know if I still loved football, basketball more than football, but I started playing. And all of a sudden, my 10th grade year, I was like, on JV, I was the leading scorer on that team. I averaged like 14, 15 points a game. And so now I saw some potential in basketball. It, it worked out because by my junior year in basketball in high school, I averaged like 18 points a game. I was first team, all area, all conference, and all of that. And so now it's like, you know, I'm a basketball player. My senior year, I really took off. I averaged 24 points a game. And I got, you know, mentioned, you know, and it's like, okay, I'm going to college. I, I knew that was going to happen now. My cousin was playing at Tyler Junior College in, in, in Tyler, Texas. And they was at Sam Houston State for a scrimmage. And somehow... He heard, overheard Sam Houston's coach, his name is Robert McPherson, was saying, man, I really need a shooter. And my cousin just basically interrupted and said, man, I got a cousin who can shoot better than anybody you got. Mm. And the coach was like, well, where is he? Who is he? And my cousin started talking about me. And he said, well, as a fact, he's in Louisville right now. He's living with my mom. And... That guy called me at a, a girl that I was dating. I don't know how he got her number, her mom's number, but her mom said, Reggie, there's this guy on the telephone from Texas. Want to talk to you. And when I got on the telephone, he said, I'm Robert McPherson. I'm a coach at Sam Houston State University. Um, I heard you can shoot the basketball. And would you be interested in just coming out to give us a look? And I'm like, Sure. I mean, I I mean, yeah. it's like God intervened, and I got on the Greyhound bus and wound up in Huntsville, Texas, someplace I'd never heard of, never been to before, and and that that's how I got to Sam Houston State. Wow, you know, I've known you for twenty eight years now, Reggie, and that is the first time I've ever heard the story about Lynn Swan being your childhood hero. So you ended up at Sam Houston State. You broke some records at Sam Houston. Do, do any of those records still stand up today? I still, I got a record, the most points ever scored on a road, 37, on a, on a road trip at Sam Houston. And I didn't have three pointers. So I feel like, you know, I, that could have been up a little bit. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I never had a chance to play with a three-point shot my whole career in high school wow. or college. And you, if you know, that's where my shots came from. Yeah. You know, and my, my coaches, ex-coaches now say, dude, if Reggie had had a three-point shot. I've seen you make a lot of three-point shots since then. Yeah, but they didn't count then. So, but then um, right now, I'm number 12 all time at Sam Houston. I'm, I'm, I think I scored 1,238 points or something like that. But I did it in three years. I mean, after what? 40 years almost, and I'm still number 12, I'll take it. So, yeah, tell us about your mentality back then as a young athlete. I guess you're in your early 20s or so. And what was your mentality like uh, back then? Because I know that I've heard your story many times, and you had made some bad decisions. You had dealt with some things. I think a basketball injury, a knee injury. And uh, you made some choices that took you to some hard places. I'm thinking about now after my sophomore year, I mean, everybody was talking about how good you are. And, and you know, you see yourself everywhere you look. At, we didn't have social media. God knows, you know, 
we we had news and we had social media then it would have been been crazy but everybody knew who Reggie was and you know I, I and I just ran with it in a negative way I started just doing things that I wasn't raised to do because I was raised in the country a country boy and I didn't know nothing about city life and the, and the hustle and the bustle and the hustle and the, the things that the city guys did and and so but since I'm the man I'm 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 supposed to do what they do and 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 it was it, it started just smoking weed all the time all the time I was a star I don't got to go to class even though I wasn't raised in that manner my attitude was one of I'm bigger than life because I can shoot a basketball I, I felt entitled, you know, I, I should get extra privilege because I can shoot a bas basketball maybe a little better than the next person. Mm -hmm. And like I said, it was those, that behavior, man, that was so destructive. And I didn't know that that's the behavior that was le leading to something that was even more destructive. It was something in my character that, that was, it, it was howliness. And we know what the Bible says about that. And, but I was playing a pickup game and I, at that time, buddy, I was, I was doing it and I broke my kneecap. It's like God said, I gave you all that talent and all that ability. And I just want you to know I can take it away from you anytime I want to. I was so caught up in realizing basketball had become a God. And we, we, we don't understand when we talk about idols and false idols and all. We can make anything an idol. And when that was taken away from me, I went down because, you know, marijuana wasn't enough. Now, I, you know, I need something that just really, I don't want to feel. I don't want to feel the disappointment. I don't want to feel the pain. And I ain't talking about the physical pain. That, that was no problem. It was that, that, that inner pain that I didn't want to feel. And I was so prideful, I didn't want no one else to see it. And I found out that, you know, you beat up a kid, they call it child abuse. You kick a dog, they call it animal abuse. You know, there's all these abuses in the world, but the only abuse, and I don't know why they call it drug abuse, but that's the only abuse that you the one being abused. Mm. So it really is not drug abuse, it's, it's, it's the me abuse. It's like setting yourself on fire, right? Right, like a forest fire, you, you light a little match and, you know, okay, I'm going to just light it and burn this little spot right here and then I'm going to put it out. Once it gets so far and it, it, and it catches and it gets so far, you realize that I, don't, I can't put it out. It takes your identity. It takes your character. It takes your integrity. Everything that I was taught as a kid, I mean, my grandparents were strict, man. They, they believed in right and wrong. My granddaddy believed in if you give a man your word, you better stick by it. Mm -hmm. You know, he was one of them, and and those were the morals that I was brought up with, good morals, and so all of that stuff. The drugs just sapped all of those morals and made me somebody that I definitely was not. So, would you say that uh, during that time you're you're doing drugs and that's escalating? Are you dealing with depression or mental health issues at the same time? And boy, we hit a term mental health. That means you're crazy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, back in the day, that's what we thought, right? That but today, crazy. but today, it's like the Surgeon General has already declared that mental health is a national crisis. We have so many young people today dealing with depression and anxiety and worry, and just. Um, I remember we we went through all of that as youngsters, right? But uh, we we didn't call it that. But I imagine you went through something in all of that. But back then, like I said, like you said, they didn't have. They didn't diagnose it and say, okay, you're going through depression. Well, you, you self-medicated, right? I mean, your dreams have been crushed. Your, maybe your dream, because maybe you only had just that one big dream, right? Make it to the NBA. And that sh is shattered. So you're self-medicating and uh, you're making some decisions on top of that. And uh, you ended up, uh, yeah, g g going into some tough places, huh? You know, I don't know a drug addict yet that can control drugs. And I, I, you know, I don't want to know them if they say they can. Because at some point, um, because the drugs are controlling, it's abusing you. And now 
when the drugs speak, you answer. You know, the drugs it becomes the master, you become the slave. And when it says, well, go do this so you can get me. Go do that, even if it's wrong, even if it's a crime, go do it. Okay, because because you you, you got to do that so you can get me. And of course, I mean, I, I did whatever I had to do to get me. And of course, once you do that long enough, you know, you, you know, the, eventually the law going to catch up with you. <laughs> and, and, you know, maybe that's one of the best things that's ever happened looking back. Because I, there are times if the law hadn't intervened, I may have been dead. I, I don't know, but God had his hand on me. And so, of course, after a while, you know, the, the system says, okay, you know, you need correction. And so I got sent to prison. The first time it was like, oh God, I went there and I became the best baller on the compound. Of course. <laughs> of course, man. I'm the man. Every, even Jimmy, today I've heard guys that's come out from the, all of those years ago, probably almost 40 years, 30 something years ago. That said, man, I've heard guys talking about you playing ball in prison. It, it became, okay, I'm known because I can play basketball. You know, and, you know, I didn't know that basketball one day would be a, by a means of doing something better. But, you know, and, and I realized now God had his hand in it the whole time. This is where our stories intersect because as a teenager, I gave my life to Christ while I was locked up in juvie in Ocala, where you are from. And uh, it was, yeah, several years later that I was visiting Lake Butler I believe his name was Alonzo Young. Was it Chaplin Alonzo? Chaplin, was that Chaplin. It? Yes, sir. Chaplin oh, Young. He was so fun. And uh, he invited me to come up and preach at chapel service. And uh, we came to Lake Butler. I brought an entourage with me. And uh, we had a good time. Yeah, band. Oh, uh, We had a good time. And that's where I meet you uh, in Lake Butler at the prison there. And after that first visit, because we had come back... Uh, uh, another time after that. But after that first visit, I came home and maybe a month later, I get a, I get a letter from you, a handwritten letter. And uh, man, you had the most incredible handwriting. Uh, I guess you had some time on your hands so you could write slow, right? <laughs> man, it was, oh, it, it was so pretty, this letter, right? It was a handwritten note. And uh, man, I didn't want to mess, mess it up or wrinkle it anything, but you, shared in this letter how, you know, when your release was coming up the next year and things you wanted to do with your life, you shared your testimony with me, you know, the regrets, the bad choices you made and, and, and how you wanted to now give back. And you wanted to come to West Palm Beach, South Florida, where we were and volunteer with Breakaway going into some of the juvenile centers. And just sharing your story, really. We weren't like planning out basketball or all this. You just wanted to come down and and basically minister to some young people that were getting in trouble. So my question is, why was that so important to you at that time of your life? When you all came there and there was different ministries, you know, there's always some kind of religious activities going on in there, people coming back. But while you was there, Maybe, you know, you you all were not religious. Mm. And, and you know, I, I hit on that when I talk to young people now or how they present themselves. You didn't come across as religious. We were, it, was a relig it was a religious service. We were just Jesus freaks, right? Exactly. It, exactly. Y'all didn't have to dress a certain way. Y'all didn't have to. But, but I could say, look, I can identify. I can identify with them. You know, I, can, I, I like that. And, and then I, I remember saying, I want to do what you do when I get out. I remember saying that. And the seed was planted. And we know how important that is. It may, it, years later before that seed, and even now that seed is still, you know, manifesting itself. But that seed was planted because in there, and even from the most, the worst, one in there who they say is incorrigible, incorrigible, hardened, 
prisoner, they're looking for some hope. Mm -hmm. They may not tell you because they may walk around with a mean mug on their face all the time, but deep down inside, I wish I could just find a little bit of hope somewhere. Mm -hmm. And that's what I found when y'all came. That, okay, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I got I just wanted to get out. I just want not, I don't want to be here. But man, it's like a spark was lit and a seed was planted and I there there was some hope. Okay. Okay. That that's that's I might be able to, to do something there. I don't have to act a certain way. I don't have to be religious. I can just be me and still be a Christian. And that's the the what you all presented to me that at, at, at that time. And so that's what attracted me to you. And I tell young people, like I say all the time, if you're going to be ministering to anybody, present yourself as authentic because a kid will see through fake. They'll see wow. through phony. But man, if you present yourself as authentic, they may listen to you. And so just be be authentic, right? Because you don't be have to try to be authentic. You be just authentic. are. Be authentic, yeah. man. Just be real. Be, be, be authentic enough to say, hey, I'm not perfect. Mm. I struggle. I have to repent. I go, you know, my thoughts are not always pure, but I have to be in constant repentance of God. And the, the Holy Spirit gives me awareness when these things are happening. And I could go to him right away and say, okay, God, it ain't, I ain't thinking right. Do this. And and so kids can identify with that. So it's like, you know, I'll be thinking that too. <laughs> and so they be like, man, my, my kids now, they be like, Pastor Reggie, you know, you." they called me two Saturdays ago, 9.30 at night. I get a prank phone call from five teenage girls in my youth group. Acting like boys. Hmm. Reggie, man, I, I'm out, man. I'm out. You helped me so much when I was in prison. Oh, thank you so much, Reggie. Thank you so much. But I'm out now. This is what they were saying. <laughs> With all the other things that they could be doing, they was having a slumber party. But all the things that they could be doing, they were thinking about me. They could have been out toilet papering the uh, pastor's house or something, right? And right, right. Well, one of the, one of them was the pastor's daughter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I don't think you better mess with his house. <laughs> but it, it that the blessing was those kids was thinking about me. Yeah, and and so and and they knew that I was witty enough that they could do that to me. That's what you with you, man. That's what I saw when you came. It was you. You were touching. And and if I recall this right, you said that uh, you you had a choice or at least a preference. You could tell them, "Hey, I want to go here for work release, yep. what have you." And I believe you had to be in work release for about a year, so you opted to come to South Florida. And I remember we would come, we would pick you up from the work release facility, take you to church. Yep. Uh, I was a youth pastor also at the time in South Florida. And we brought you and a couple other uh, guys from work release to come and share testimonies at a youth rally at the church. And uh, you would come also to the, the juvenile center, the uh, boot camp, uh, stop camp was yeah. the one that we did every week, Jonathan Dickinson Stop Camp. Yep, Hope Sound. And uh, Hope Sound, Florida, right. And and we would go up there. And then uh, I remember we just said, hey, let's uh, let's go take a basketball one Saturday and play play basketball with these boys because we had already been doing Bible studies and right. sharing the gospel in different ways. But to take a ball and go out and engage, uh, something really – dynamic happened when we began to do that. And, you know, here's the thing, Reggie, I travel last year, I, I traveled 16 weeks uh, overseas doing sports ministry. You know, Breakaway Sports has now served in 12 countries on four different continents. Wow. And it's amazing when I look at how God is using the tool of sport right? To reach kids for Christ and develop leaders as well, next generation leaders. You know, we're in Europe, Africa, Korea, Latin America. And I always get this question. Um, how did you get into all this? Where did it all start? <laughs> right. And it's funny because everything that we do today 
yeah. in sports ministry on all these different continents and regions can be traced back to you and me picking up a basketball yeah. in a juvie center in South Florida one Saturday afternoon saying, let's go out and do something fun with these boys, play basketball. And then we shared testimonies in the gospel with him. It was so effective, right? Yeah. It, I, I like to call it like the boy in the Bible that just had his five loaves, two fish, just giving it to Jesus, right. whatever he had. Right. You had right. a basketball. We right. had our, I mean, you had talent. I, uh, I, I knew how to get you the ball play, to you. I like to tell people it was like the Christian white man can't jump, but the difference was, and in the movie, the white man actually could jump, you know, but I just knew what I, I probably learned. My greatest leadership lesson back then was get the ball to Reggie. Right, like you play. know who your talent is. Know where the gifting is on your team and get the ball to them and let them do their thing. And that's a leadership principle that has stayed with me all these years. Recognize the talent around you. The, the leaders, the young leaders that you're investing in, that you're developing and building up, look right. for their talents and then right. get the ball in their hands and give them opportunities to make plays and good things happen when we do that. So we didn't have like this elaborate plan for sports ministry, but that's where it all began. The breakaway sports ministry started right there. So tell us about those early beginnings, you know, specifically with basketball. We started in one facility. We would get invited to another one. I remember we did one in the Everglades where there was alligators, yes. you know, out there yes. instead of like barbed wire fence because those boys weren't going to run away at all. We just went so many different places. We traveled to Georgia, New York together doing all these different uh, sports ministries and juvie centers. And uh, yeah, take us back down memory lane to some of those early beginnings and what that was like. Give me your take on it. You, you know, we if we knew then what we know now, we would have a name, it would be the Juvie Globetrotters. <laughs> the Juvie Globetrotters. Because <laughs> we, we went everywhere, bro. And, and the thing about it is basketball had taken on a different meaning for me then. You know, man, when, you know, I told you basketball used to be my God. I used to use it to beat people up. Mm. I used to use it to, to make people think I'm better than you because I can, you can't stop me. But then once we start playing with those kids, it's like basketball took on a whole new meaning. It's like, and I just, and I, I was at my best. I could shoot then. I mean, I could shoot, 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 shoot. And those kids would be mesmerized. I mean, I might hit seven, eight, nine, ten shots in a row, and they sitting there like, like, whoa. And all God was doing is saying, you got their attention. Mm -hmm. You, He used my jump shot to get their attention. And later on, I, I, I found where it says, a man's gift will make room for itself, and it will bring you before great men. That's a lesson that I, I pass on. A man's gift will make room for itself and bring you before great men. I always had the gift. Mm -hmm. But the way that I used the gift was the difference between it being a perversion or a provision. Wow. Because I was perverting the gift when I was using basketball to make make me think I was better than everybody else. But then it became a provision because now I'm using that same jump shot to be able to open the door and sit down and talk to a kid. And I can never forget, we were in Tennessee. I don't know the facility. And we played. And this one, one young man was good. But man, after he watched me play, he had a red band around his arm. And I knew automatically what that meant. He was part of the Bloods. Mm -hmm. And we talked. And I said, what you want to do? He said, man, all I want to do is get out and go play basketball. All I want to do is get out and go play basketball. And in my heart, I was like, man, I would love to take you somewhere because you could play. You you put in the effort. You could play, and you could you could play. And but he says, "I'm in," Me meaning that he was in the game. Mm -hmm. 
And he was blood in and blood out. And he didn't want to go back. To, he did not want to go back to Memphis. I even talked to his mom one time about how could we get this kid somewhere else? Because in his heart, that basketball, we, when we played that day, he just wanted to go somewhere and play basketball. Because I kept saying, dude, you can play, man. The real victory wasn't in us scoring more points than them. The real victory was in we got a chance to share a message that a plant a seed that we don't know to this day to for some of them what that seed is doing. And that's the power of sport, right? Sports ministry is now such a power. A lot of churches are using it as an outreach because it is such a powerful tool to connect with, uh, especially young people, right? I mean, obviously, we've taken the basketball ministry into juvie centers and youth prisons and even recovery centers. We've done some drug rehabs and such and schools, neighborhoods uh, overseas. We've we've used sport in refugee camps uh, to minister and share the gospel. Why do you think sport is so effective in breaking down barriers and building bridges uh, into the lives of, of those that might otherwise not even be receptive to the gospel. Why is it so effective using sport to share the love of Jesus, right? I think sport is like a universal language. You may be black, I may be white, vice versa, Mexican, wherever, but when we pick up this ball, <laughs> it's orange. <laughs> And regardless of what language you speak or what ethnicity or whatever, this ball is, 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 is what we got in common right now. Yeah. Whether it's a baseball, you do the baseball camps, or a basketball or soccer, whatever it is, that ball, that sport is what is joining us together. It's a universal language. Well, Reggie, when I look at your life, you truly are an inspiration to me. I mean, you're a brother to me. You're one of the best friends I've ever had on this planet. We've been at this a long time together. But I look at you and I see God's redemptive fingerprints all over your life. What you've been through, what you've overcome, you're victorious through Jesus. That is such a beautiful thing that your victory comes from God. Um, you've overcome addiction. You've overcome, obviously, a, a, a past that has shame and regret attached to it. But you've been forgiven. You've been given new life. What would you say to someone out there? Maybe there's a young person today that is going through some battles, whether it's mental health battles, uh, depression, or uh, maybe even an addiction that they just don't feel that they can overcome or break right now. And they're lacking personal peace. They don't know where it comes from. Uh, what would you say to that person today about uh, discovering personal peace and finding a path of victory over those demons or giants, if you will? Surrender to win. Tell on pride, because pride kept me out there much longer than I could have been and should have been because of my pride. But when I learned that if I'm going to win, I have to surrender. And in order to surrender, you have to let go of pride. Get with a winner. Make, you got to get somebody that you trust and you got to be able to be open and transparent and nothing is too shameful and too bad that you've done that you can't tell them mm -hmm. because they say we are only as sick as our secrets and the enemy wants you to hold it inside. Don't tell nobody. Don't tell nobody. You, you look stupid. If you tell somebody you did that. I tell, uh, you're, you're talking about mentors and I tell young people, all the time that just having one person in their corner can make all the difference in the world. Right. I mean, for me, I didn't have many mentors, uh, in my teenage years, but when I finally got one, 
And that man stood in my corner and, and became really a father figure to me. He restored things that were broken in my life. And he gave me confidence, right? That, that God was for me, had a plan for me. And I could, I could pursue that mentors are game changers. And with breakaway outreach, like we rely on mentors and the kids that we serve rely on mentors. Uh, what would be maybe something that you would say would be an encouragement to people to get into the game, the mentoring game? Because certainly there are people out there that want to make a difference in the world. They see young people in trouble. They see all this despair and hopelessness. They want to make a difference, right? What would you say to somebody just sitting on the sideline right now, sitting on the bench, but they can be a game-changing mentor in someone's life, right? Uh, what what would you say to them? I mean, before they even got off the bench, right? What what would you say to them about getting into the game? Brother, and I'm, I'm going to say I'm quoting one of my mentors right now, Brother Bob. He... He was just an old country boy from Cordell, Georgia. So he was he wasn't trained or whatever. But he said, All right, now, God, I've done something for you. Now, you can either sit in the pew or you can stand on the promises. And, and what he was trying to say is, you can take what God has done for you and sit down on it. Or you can take it and do something with it. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Man, you you the, what you're doing right now, Jimmy, and, and, and with Breakaway in the sports ministry, it's just a great commission manifesting itself from me and you just going to play basketball at the stop camp and whatnot, and and the great commission, and, and now you're in the, the the Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. You're taking it, and we can't allow ourselves to become stagnant because brother you may not think you can make a difference sister you may not think you can make a difference but there's some young woman or young man out there that God has hand picked for you and I'm might can mentor and minister and whatever but that that one, he handpicked them for you. And you might be the difference between that person failing or succeeding because there's something in you that that person is going to see through your experiences, through whatever, that I don't have. And you and only you could be that one that makes a difference in that person's life. So none of us, none of us, is irrelevant. So you got to seek God and find out where I can be of service because he'll show you. I want to ask you this, Reg, just as an encouragement for youth workers, you know, I'm in my fifties, you're now in your sixties, right? Yes. Uh, but it's, it's the ripe, it's the ripe old age that we're in, right? <laughs> um, you know, when I look at you, into your 60s, you stay fit, you're engaged in youth and young adult ministry with your church, you still serve with breakaway in different capacities, uh, you mentor young people in Ocala, Florida through your basketball program. I know a lot of people today that are tapping out when it comes to youth work. I, I've got friends that are teachers in schools that are tapping out because it is getting so difficult, challenging uh, to stay in the game of working with young people because of all of the challenges that they're facing today. Right. Right. Uh, you haven't tapped out. Uh, we haven't tapped out. We've been at this for a minute now. It's trench warfare. It is not easy. This is like not Mayberry. This is like saving private Ryan stuff. Right. Uh, and that's what we're talking about here. Um, what would you say to youth workers out there? Just a word of encouragement about keeping yourself fresh and fit, right? Staying mentally strong, spiritually fit, physically, um, just stable to, to just stay in the game because young people need us to stay in the game today, right? They need us. The next generation 
needs us. Like their future is dependent on our generation uh, staying in the game for them. So what would you say to youth workers that might be discouraged out there? They're just maybe even right now feeling like they just want to tap out. It's not worth it anymore. Uh, maybe the the big win is no longer as big as it used to be. Uh, what would be some encouragement that you might give some youth workers out there? You know, first and foremost, and, and this has come through seasoning. It, it, I didn't always have this philosophy, but as I've grown and matured in ministry, I have to look at myself in the mirror and say, it's not about you. Mm -hmm. It's not about me. And I have to, first and foremost, stay connected to God. I have to stay in my devotions. I have to stay connected to God because without him, you know, if whenever we get that attitude that I'm ready to tap out, I'm tired, it's not God telling us that. It, we're allowing the enemy to get a foothold because he wants us to quit. Because when you quit, that next person that you were going to reach, you can't reach. So the enemy, that's his way of saying, tap out, man. You, it, you're tired of this, man. It's wearing you out. These kids are disrespectful and that this and that and the other. And then the Lord says, Reggie, what if I had tapped? What if I had tapped out when you were disrespectful? That's how the Reggie, what if I had thrown in the towel when you guys was dogging me out? My lesson with my kids Sunday was, what if he had changed his mind? So it's like, whenever I get, I think I'm to the end of my rope and I can't take it no more. Remember Jesus. You got to go to the cross. You, 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 you have to get out of yourself. If you want to be refreshed, if you ever want to be refreshed when you're feeling weakened, go to the cross. Just take some time out and go to the cross. Meaning, re remember Jesus looking down on you with those eyes, bloody and beaten and abused and, and, and mutilated. But the eyes... And, they, they're still looking at me. And those eyes are saying, I love you. And I won't quit. I won't quit because I love you. And so whenever you is tasked with dealing with these young people, just remember, tell them you love them. Well, you know, as you're, you're sharing that look to Jesus, right? I'm just reminded of, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, in chapter 11, we see all of these broken and flawed misfits, really, <laughs> that <laughs> God chose. <laughs> it's called heroes, heroes, but they really were just misfits. They weren't misfits. even superheroes. They were just misfits. Yes. And God used them. And we have this whole account that we call the Hall of Faith. It's kind of like the Hall of Fame, right? God's Hall of Fame. And you read a Hebrews 11, and you're like, wow, look at all these people that God used, men, women. And then you get over to Hebrews 12, and what it says is, look unto Jesus. It's like, here's an example. You see a lot of people that I used, but ultimately, look to Jesus. And it says there that we need to look to him as the author and the, and finisher, the finisher of our faith. Who? for the joy that was set before him Come endured the cross. Right. And, and, and this is what I'm hearing in my spirit as you're talking about this, looking at the Jesus, what if Jesus had tapped out, right? What if Jesus had said, no, it's, it's just not worth it. I'm going to give up. And, 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 and the scripture tells us to look at that. It doesn't tell us to look at David. It doesn't tell us to look at Barak or Samson or Rahab. It says these are examples of people that God used in his, in his grace. But look at Jesus. Because if you just look at David, you're going to end up tapping out. If you just look at Peter, you're going to end up tapping out. If you just look at Paul, you're going to end up tapping out. Because none of them can give you strength. Only Jesus can give you that great big win and keep it before you as the main thing, right? And I believe that's why God just wants us to keep our focus where it needs to be. You said the cross. When Jesus was on that cross, there is no greater depiction of one 
who endured the greatest pain, the greatest suffering so that we could walk in victory in that new life that he's given us. Brother says, it says to know him and the power of his resurrection, but also in the fellowship of his suffering. Okay, the power of his resurrection, we all want that. That's awesome, man. I mean, but he's saying that, that it, that's, it's not always a bed of roses. Knowing me ain't always going to be easy. The fellowship of my suffering. I'm telling you, it ain't going to be easy. It ain't supposed to be. I didn't do this for it to be easy. But there's purpose in my pain. And the and he's the author and the finisher of that purpose. He's going to, and he says that what he begins, he's going to bring to completion, right? He's going to finish what he started in us so that we can finish what he wow. has started through us. Wow. God is going to finish what he started in us so that he can finish what he started through us. Wow. Well, I love that we don't have to fight for victory. We get to fight from victory, right? Man, awesome. That victory that he has already given us. And we just get even even when we fall. The Bible says righteous man will fall seven times, seven times, you know, in one one day. But you can get back up and Jesus has made that victory possible. So That's awesome, man. the old yeah. school mixtape number one.